Would you please welcome to the stage executive coach for our product leaders, Kate Alito. I have to say hi to my mom on the camera because I promised her I would. Hi, my name's Kate Lido. I'm an executive coach. I work with product execs and leaders at organizations of all shapes and sizes all over the world. And for those of you who haven't been part of a coaching engagement yet, I can tell you one of the first questions your coach is going to ask you is what brings you to coaching? You know, what do you want to work on? And as you can imagine, the responses that I get to that question are quite diverse. However, I picked up pretty early on that when I asked product people that question, there was a pattern, there was a theme. And that was, there was all a big level of ambition in what they were wanting to do. They didn't want to just be good at whatever they came to work on. They wanted to be super successful at it. So to help them think about what success was and what that really meant to them, I went and did some research of, of my own on success, not just in product management, but success overall. And as you do, as we all do, I started with Google, and I just typed in the vaguest, biggest question I could. What is success? And the results that I got back were varied and numerous, quite numerous. One of them caught my attention. It said success equals 85% soft skills and 15% hard skills. And it caught my attention because it kind of fit with my attitude that I brought to coaching that a lot of the work we needed to do is around the human side, maybe not as much around the technique side. But it was also interesting because it seemed to me that it was packaged almost like too perfectly, right? Like in the olden days, this would have been on a bumper sticker. So I wanted to know more. I wanted to know if this was real data or if it was fake news, if it was real, where did it come from? What were the questions asked? Was it statistically significant? So I went down this massive rabbit hole online and I found out that the data was real. It was extrapolated from a report done by this man, Charles Riborg Mann, who in 1918 was a physicist at the University of Chicago. And he was commissioned by the Carnegie Foundation and various engineering societies at the time to help them understand if the education on offer for engineering students was actually preparing them for successful careers. So Charles said, sure, we can take this on. And he kicked off a multi-year study to help answer that question. And one of the things he did was he sent out 30,000 surveys <laughs> to people to, associated with engineering across the United States. And imagine this was in 1918. Like, a lot of postal mail and Pony Express-like visions just conjure up in my mind. But he asked them to prioritize criteria for success um, in engineering. And he gave them six terms to work from and to prioritize. Technique, which is what they'd learned in school, judgment, efficiency, knowledge, character, which Charles defined as the mental and moral qualities of an individual, like honesty and adaptability. Also, the last one was understanding of men, which is one of my favorites. But at, at the time, it was kind of like a precursor to modern day management practices. So Charles did get a statistically significant response to his survey, I'm happy to say. And overwhelmingly, the response was that character was the most important criteria for success in engineering. What came in last was technique, what they had learned in school. So Charles validated this finding again and again and again over a number of years. And in his final report, he said that if you really want to help prepare these students to be successful in their careers, you need to make space within your schooling, within the curriculum, to focus on personal development, to focus on character development, so they could get to know who they are, what their values are, what their beliefs are, because that was really what the secret to success in engineering was. So, flash forward way over 100 years, and here we are in lovely Dublin, and I tried really, really hard to find out what was the direct impact of Charles's research on engineering education at the time, and I couldn't find a lot, to be honest. 
The mentions I did find said that his report was received really warmly, really well. However, it kind of got lost in the chaos of the times. It was 1918, World War I was coming to an end, lots going on. However, there's no doubt that his focus on the importance of personal development and character development and helping us to reach success and the data that he found in his studies is still with us. I mean, I'm still quoting it off of Google today. What has changed over the last century is the vocabulary and really the definition and the science behind how we talk about this today. So, for example, a couple years after Charles' report came out in 1918, so in 1920, the idea of social intelligence as kind of the secret to success became popular. And social intelligence was defined as getting to know, the ability to know somebody like a book, right? And a couple of decades later, we heard for the first time the concept of soft skills something else I've already quoted today. And soft skills, believe it or not, comes from a US military manual about, um, or for officers. Basically, it said, if you want to be a successful leader and officer in the US military, you've got to have the hard skills to be able to work with like the equipment, with ammunition, with planes, and with paper, which I found odd, but also you have to have the soft skills to be able to work with people. And then, a couple of decades later again, we start to hear about this concept of emotional intelligence that became really, really popular in 1995 when a guy named Daniel Goleman wrote a book that argued that emotional intelligence, or EQ, which is your measurement of emotional intelligence, is actually more important than your IQ in attaining success in life, whatever that success may look like. And the idea of emotional intelligence is something that really is kind of that X factor in helping us to reach success. It's something that stayed with us. You know, it's very much part of our vernacular today. So much so in 2020, the World Economic Forum um, and their Future of Jobs report even said that employers who are interviewing, the number one skill they're actually looking for is emotional intelligence. So before I go on, I want to make sure we're all on the same page with what is this thing, what is emotional intelligence. So according to the Institute for Human Potential and Health, they say that emotional intelligence is the ability to recognize, understand, and manage our own emotions, and recognize, understand, and influence the emotions of others. And Daniel Goldman, the psychologist who wrote the book in 1995 about EQ, has done a lot of research, he and his colleagues have over the last few decades, and continue to refine and structure this concept of emotional intelligence. And they say that emotional intelligence has four competencies, self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, and relationship management. And within those four competencies are a number of skills, which I bet you guys have all heard of. Things like self-awareness and empathy and positive outlook and adaptability, the skill of being able to coach and mentor other people, teamwork, the ability to be an inspirational leader, the ability to deal with conflict. All of these are skills within emotional intelligence. And research does show that individuals and teams and organizations with high levels of emotional intelligence tend to outperform, tend to be more successful than those with lower levels of emotional intelligence. So, for example, individuals with higher levels of emotional intelligence tend to make more money annually than individuals in similar roles with lower levels of emotional intelligence. When this report came out a few years ago, it was about $29,000 more a year. And I have a feeling that number may have actually gone up given the last few years that we've had. In teams with high levels of self-awareness, and teams can have self-awareness and it can be measured, they tend to coordinate their work better, they make decisions better, and they deal with conflict better. They're higher performing, they're more successful. And organizations with high levels of empathy tend to outperform financially organizations with lower levels of empathy. So all in all, like lots of good stuff, lots of benefits from emotional intelligence and really focusing on it. But here's the, here's the thing, when I look around our product community, which I've been a part of for over 25 years now, what I see is our focus remains very much what Charles warned us about. It's very much on our technique. It's very much on our functional skills. We talk a lot about roadmaps, 
which are, you know, it's great, but we talk a lot about roadmaps. We talk a lot about A-B testing, multivariate testing, MVPs, OKRs. Oh my God, we could talk for years about OKRs. And I think we probably already have. And it's not that this is bad, because all of these functional skills, our technique is the basis of what we do, right? It's the foundation of our discipline that's bringing us all together today, which is awesome. However, it means that we don't focus as much, we don't give enough space, for how we do the work. And that's where emotional intelligence really comes in. And when you think about it, the two are already very intertwined. So if you want to build a roadmap, it's not just about what software you're using, what cadence you're going to update, and how you're going to communicate it, all of those great things. It's also about having the emotional intelligence to carry it out. You got to have the self-awareness to be able to raise your hand and say, well, maybe the thing I'm pressing for and driving for on this roadmap is out of my own best interest, not the best interest of my team or my organization. You've got to have the conflict resolution skills to deal with the tension and conflict that comes up when you're putting together a roadmap, because there's always going to be some tension involved. You've got to have the inspirational leadership skills to be able to bring your challenging stakeholders and bring your team along with you and what you think the vision of this roadmap should be. Even when it comes to hiring, how we carry ourselves, how we think of ourselves. Our emotional intelligence plays a huge factor. I wrote a book about emotional intelligence in hiring. And everything from the way that we think about the job description to the way that we, um, the questions that we pick out for the interview to how we consider the candidate's performance in their interview is impacted by our emotional intelligence and the candidate's emotional intelligence. There's a lot going on there. So, with all of that in mind, I think as a community, it's time for us really to reframe our narrative around what is success in product management. Learn the lesson that Charles was trying to, te Charles was trying to teach all of us over 100 years ago. And make space within all of this talk about our technique and functional skills for how we do the work. And to make space for how we develop and grow our emotional intelligence. And the good thing is, is you can do it. Um, that's often one of the first questions I'm asked is, emotional intelligence, is that something you can grow? And yes, you can. Um, it does take a lot of discipline and commitment, though. You've got to be ready to do it, and you've got to really want to do it. And when you are ready, I'd say the first place to start, the first skill to get going on, is, is self-awareness. Why self-awareness? Well, it really is kind of a, it's a foundational skill. Right for everything else that's going on in the emotional intelligence. And according to uh, Tasha Yurek, who is the author of this great book called Insight, it's kind of self-awareness is kind of the meta skill of our time. According to Yurek, there's two types of self-awareness. There's internal self-awareness and there's external self-awareness. Internal self-awareness is, I think, the one that we're all really familiar with, the ability to see ourselves clearly. External self-awareness is, is how others see us and how we fit into the world around us. And the goal when you're working on building your self-awareness is to focus on both of these and really have them in balance. Because when they do, it shows up in your work every day as product people. It shows up in how you make decisions because you're going to know what your motivations are and where they're coming from. It shows up in your overall approach to work because you're going to know your strengths and you're going to know your weaknesses and you're going to know how to work with both. It shows up in how you lead because you're going to be able to show and portray your convictions, but you're also going to be able to be humble and curious and bring that into your work. And it shows up in how you learn because we, with self-awareness, we can build this great skill of reflection and have the ability to take a step back and think like, okay, maybe the thing I did there isn't what I really want to do next time. It gives you the muscle to do that. So, I can only imagine your response is what mo many of my clients is when I start talking about self-awareness. Yep, I already got it. I am a self-aware person. No need to continue on. Um, well, you're not alone if you do think that. So, Yurik, whose book I was showing just a minute ago, Insight, did a lot of research for her, for her publication. And she found out that while well, 95% of people that they interviewed thought they were self-aware, the number was really more around 10 to 15%. Another organization called the Hay Group interviewed 17,000 people around the world. 
um, and found that about 19% of those, 19% of, let me start that again, 19% of women who they interviewed met the criteria for self-awareness, and about 4% of men did. So once again, we all have some work to do. So what I'm going to share with you now are three ways that you can start to build your self-awareness. I call this the trilogy of self-awareness. It's know thyself, accept thyself, and improve thyself. So we're going to start with know thyself. So, and you'll notice that know thyself and accept thyself really kind of feed directly into internal self-awareness and external self-awareness. First way to get going with know thyself is practicing self-reflection. So no big surprise with this, really, right? Um, when I did my research for my book, I actually found an interesting study that said that a daily habit of self-reflection can boost your performance by 23%. So why not give it a go? We're not talking about hours sitting and journaling about what you've done and why you did it. We're talking about taking five, 10 minutes in the morning, maybe five, 10 minutes in the evening, whatever works for you. Maybe it's on your commute, maybe it's um, at home before you open your home office door, taking pen and paper and writing the response to a couple of questions, really simple questions. What do you want to accomplish today? What are you worried about today? Maybe at the end of the day, what worked well? What do you want to do differently tomorrow? What are you grateful for from today? Bring gratitude into the conversation and thinking as well. You'll notice with all of those, they start with what, right? There's not a why question in sight. Why? Well, why, asking ourselves why in many ways is extremely ineffective. Um, if we knew why we did something or why we didn't do something, there's a chance we wouldn't have done it in the first place, right? But also, when you sit back and actually ask yourself and challenge yourself with why, our brains are just not in that kind of objective place where they can properly positively respond. Instead, it kind of sends us on some really negative thought patterns that we just don't want to go into. So focus on what questions, what creates, creates space and future, future focus. One more thing about self-reflection before I move on, and that is you don't want to overload, right? Because when you do, when you become kind of that person that is so um, so in tune and so focused on journaling, on keeping track of what you're doing and how you're feeling, you can actually go too far and you can go too inside, too internal. You need to be able to lift yourself up, identify some patterns, maybe share it with a partner or a team member or a colleague or a coach, um, and just kind of take note of the high-level data that you're finding out. We don't want to come across as too, too self-obsessed, and we don't want to get stuck in our own heads. OK, so that's know thyself. You can start to get to know thyself through a daily habit of self-reflection. Five minutes in the morning, five minutes in the evening, that's all you got to do. Accept thyself gets a little more challenging. Not in getting the feedback, because with accept, uh, accept thyself, we're really identifying and accepting our blind spots. We can get the information pretty easily. You know, every organization that I've been working with recently does 360 feedback once a year or something like that. Maybe you have like a great feedback loop with um, your manager already where you're getting feedback in real time. So it's not the challenge of really getting the feedback, but what the challenge is, is actually accepting it as real. There's a great executive coach named Marshall Goldsmith, and he has this book called What Got You Here Won't Get You There. And he says that the true challenge in identifying our blind spots is taking feedback that we may not really feel kind of aligns with our worldview. And if it doesn't align with our worldview, then it's something that we disregard completely. We don't take on. So in order to get past that challenge, he says you've got to ask the right people, ask the right questions, interpret the answers properly, and accept the responses as accurate. Now, we don't have enough time for me to get through all of that today, so I'm going to focus just on the first one, ask the right people. How can asking the right people help you understand um, what these blind spots are and accept it as true? I'm going to introduce two practices. One is trusted critic. Trusted critic, I got to believe, helps you kind of, helps you ask the right people because you're picking the people. You're picking people who you believe have your best interests at heart, but they're not going to sugarcoat the truth. They're going to be direct with you. They're people that you trust, 
okay? Probably not your mom, probably not a close member of your family or your partner, but somebody who, um, who really is going to give it to you straight. And all you're going to do, you're going to find, if you can, three or four of these folks, and you're going to ask them to make a list of what they see as your strengths and weaknesses. And you're going to do the same, and you're going to come together, and most likely there's going to be a gap in the list, right? There should be. It'd be really spooky if there wasn't. Um, but the bigger the gap, the more work you have to do, obviously, because that's where your blind spots are. So once again, from an, from an experiment and from a practice like Trusted Critic, you're going to identify some high-level learnings that we're going to put to use in just a minute. The second um, practice I want to introduce to you to help you kind of accept these blind spots as true is observational feedback. And I got to believe this is asking the right person because it's, it's you doing the work. You're going to take on the role as kind of an anthropologist. Right? You're going to identify, maybe it's an hour meeting, maybe it's a day, maybe it's a few days. And you're going to write down every casual remark said about you. And you have to hold yourself really accountable for this. But some of them, it could be like, you're late, Kate. You're on mute, Kate. I get that all the time. Um, are you listening to me, Kate? You're interrupting, Kate. You already said that, Kate. Maybe if I take it to the entire day, I might get that dinner was great, Kate. Something like that. But after a few days, or whatever, the end of whatever period you decided to be, if it's an hour meeting, if it's a day or a few days, sit down again and identify your high-level patterns. What maybe, have, what maybe have you captured that you were unaware of? You know, maybe you realized that you wrote down a few times that somebody said you were interrupting, and that was something you just weren't aware you were doing. Maybe it's a flip side of that. Maybe you um, were told a few times that you're not speaking up enough something else to keep track of. So the thing is, is that we're going to pull this all together into the final aspect of our trilogy, which is improve thyself. And we're going to do what we product people do really, really well, which is build an experiment. You're going to take your insights from self-reflection and from observational feedback and from trusted critic and whatever else you've been working on, and you're going to build an experiment around three parts, learn, act, and adapt. Learn is you're just taking your high-level learning about something that you found out about yourself that you want to do differently. You're going to figure out what action you can take for a specific amount of time that can put this to the test and can be a different approach. And then you're going to check in on yourself. You're going to see how you did. And you're going to continue to adapt, maybe do it differently next time around, and keep the loop going. So what you're building is a self-awareness learning loop, my friends. And that's part of a wider cycle of continuous personal discovery. This is where I think things get really hard, because this is where it's important to really have that discipline and commitment to check in on yourself and follow up. This is where the work, real, the rubber really kind of hits the road. So this is where I encourage you to really work with somebody else, maybe a peer coach, maybe a colleague, maybe a partner, maybe an external coach, to go through this process. So. In summary, that's gone really fast for me. <laughs> but in summary, to try to pull this all together, I think that Charles was right. And we still haven't learned the lessons that he was trying to communicate to us and teach us over 100 years ago. If you want to be successful in whatever it is, in product management or whatever else in life, in life. It's not just about what you do. It's not your technique. You got to make space to understand and work on how you do it. And that's where emotional intelligence, I think, can really come into play. Start with self-awareness. Start to get to know thyself, to accept thyself, improve thyself. Start that continuous personal discovery loop. Because at the end of the day, I can tell you, with all of my clients, not one of them has kind of ended an engagement feeling good and feeling different because I gave them an OKR framework. It's always come from within them. And as always, if I can help, please let me know and keep in touch. Thank you.